Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Virginia SBDC's webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. This series is designed to take a look at tools and techniques to help small businesses take their business to the next level on the web. Today's webinar is Small Business Telecommunicating Telecommuting Success. All of our Google and Beyond webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith of W3 Consulting, a web and mobile strategies and training consultancy for small businesses. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those in the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC Network for having me on for these Google and Beyond Marketing and Managing on the Web webinar series. Uh, as Tracy said, we'll be talking about small business telecommunicating telecommunic success today. And uh, just if you have any questions, feel free to, as Tracy said, ask through the question panel. After the, the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, shoot me a tweet at W3Consulting. You can go ahead and hashtag that beyond Google. So getting right into it, today we're going to be discussing the uh, concept of telecommuting. I'm going to define telecommuting and, and really why it works and uh, a little bit about when it doesn't, but not really going to focus on that. And we're going to talk about Marissa Meyer and, or Mayer and her uh, decision to pull the plug on telecommuting, uh, the telecommuting program there at Yahoo, and why I believe she's probably wrong. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, telecommuting programs and what they need to be effective not really the policy itself. We're not going to talk about policy governance and so forth, but I'm going to talk about the general guidelines for being able to have an effective telecommuting program, or TP. And then we're going to talk about what tools can help you make telecommuting manageable and perhaps even fun. So with that agenda in mind, uh, let's talk about what is telecommuting and what really brought me to talk about telecommuting. And uh, so I started at a law firm many, many years ago. And one of my jobs in management for this particular law firm was to institute a telecommuting policy. And uh, so I sort of convened a group of people that I thought would be helpful within the organization and also some consultants. And we worked through setting up what I believe was a really effective telecommuting program. After we instituted the policy and set up the program, uh, we then started tracking the metrics of how productive our employees were, that is the attorneys and the legal staff, the administrative staff, as well as the management staff, in terms of being able to make sure we were moving forward with the goals of this particular company. Uh, subsequent to that, I've had the opportunity to invest in, in implementing several telecommuting programs, not only with my own companies, but also within other companies. And it's just been a really exciting and burgeoning field. And I think that what we're going to talk about today is going to be really, really great. So what is telecommuting? In some of the more classical literature about telecommuting, they talk about it in terms of sort of like a work arrangement. It's a, a work flexibility program. I like to think of it a little bit differently. I tend to think about it as a distributed workforce program. That is. Telecommuting is the ability for you to be able to take your employees and keep them where they are, where you know you get up in the morning, you get out of bed, and without having to go too far, you are ready to work, uh, as opposed to having them commute to a physical office or a centralized office space. They are there physically situated where you, you want them to be. So that's really what telecommuting is. And uh, many times people sort of have uh, a number of different confusions about telecommuting versus telework versus remote working. And in general, what we can do is sort of define telecommuting as that work that's done primarily at home or maybe in the home office. And uh, you're working out of that space instead of going to another work environment or to the centralized office or headquarters. Okay. Telework is a little bit different because teleworkers are people who go to centralized or distributed office spaces with other teleworkers. So for example, if you go to a client site, you're not telecommuting, you're actually teleworking because you don't have the infrastructure and control over that space. Teleworking is, is going to several different decentralized workspaces of a company but not necessarily within your own sort of control as the telecommuter, okay, or the teleworker in this case. So teleworking 
telecommuting, it's sort of semantics, but it's good for you to really understand that we're talking about telecommuting today, the idea of working primarily from home or a home office space where you have control over that space and you as the business owner have some you know, control over how that telecommuter uses and, and uh, dedicates that space to your business operations. Okay? So, with that under, the, under our belt, let's talk a little bit about teleworking and where it currently is. Today, we can estimate that roughly about 40% of the United States working population can telecommute at least part-time. So we know that a large majority, that is a large minority, of the U.S. working population could be telecommuters if we all got together and made that happen. The unfortunate circumstance is that less than 10% of the U.S. working population currently tele telecommutes. So that means that we are the lowest average of all of the other industrialized nations. The other industrialized nations fit somewhere about one in five workers, so that's you know, nearly 10% of the workforce uh, in some countries. Some are up to up upwards of 20% of the workforce in some of these countries. We in the United States know we can go up to about 40%, and yet we're, we're just under 7%. So we have a long way to go, and I believe that you as small business owners can really make that happen by effectively instituting telecommuting programs within your company. So why telecommuting works? Well, telecommuting works for many different reasons, but I really want to tackle the big reason why Marissa Mayer of Yahoo decided that she wouldn't have a telecommuting program for Yahoo that was a long-standing policy within the company and uh, roughly about 200 of, the, of Yahoo's 12,000 employees were taking advantage of this particular program. I don't mean abusing the program, they were taking advantage of it in the sense that they were using it. And uh, so she decided uh, to go ahead and do this. Uh, she, she instituted a policy where she was basically bringing everyone who was a telecommuter back to the uh, Yahoo's offices and they were no longer allowed to telecommute. Uh, this of course sent a shockwave through the business industry and uh, for instance Best Buy, they decided that they would end its uh, flexible work policy just one week after Yahoo announced it. It became a tide, you know, sort of a, a, a groundswell of other major corporations having to reassess whether or not workplace flexibility programs actually worked and, and it really competes against the, the, the employee's well-being, as we'll talk about shortly. So Marissa basically said this was an individual decision for an individual corporation. She wasn't making a decision for all companies. It wasn't supposed to be, be as she quoted it. It, it. Quote, unquote, she says, it was wrongly perceived as an industry narrative. She then goes to say, quote, it's not what's right for Yahoo right now, end quote. So I think for a lot of us, we took her statement as sort of a, a pot shot at telecommuting, but in reality, she was just saying that in Yahoo's case, they really need, needed to do this for very specific reasons. Uh, and these are the specific reasons. One is that telecommuters, as Mercer clearly defended, telecommuters who work alone are more productive than people who are in offices. That's a really important point. They're more productive. However, those who collaborate, that is people who con convene in offices together, tend to be more collaborative and more innovative. And so she's talking about the idea that in Yahoo, they really needed some innovation, sort of a kick in the pants. And this was her ability to be able to do that, was to bring together the intellectual body of, of, of professionals and really make that happen. So don't take Yahoo's decision to, to quash their telecommuting program temporarily, I think, to being uh, something that's against telecommuting as a whole. But there are some really important facts about telecommuting that we should really understand. And there's so many benefits. But it can serve our most important asset in life. That is, as individuals, time is our greatest asset. I believe we can all agree on that. And so, therefore, reducing daily traveling commutes and other kinds of wasteful activities that lead up to and uh, subsequent to going to and from an office environment, the average American commute has been longer and longer. It keeps growing every day, uh, every year, I mean. 
And so we have this uh, ongoing uh, problem of people's commutes getting longer. So uh, reducing that in, in any way, shape, or form is, is good for the individual. As well as well, environmentally oriented, there is a huge benefit to us to the idea of telework, uh, teleworking or telecommuting, if, if, and that's, if that's the case. If the U.S. government were to telecommute full-time, if they just instituted a full-time telecommuting policy today, they would save $13.9 billion annually. In addition to that, they would also save 21.5 billion pounds of pollutants from making its way into the environment. So, and this is per year. So there's a really huge impact that we can have just by telecommuting. Now that's the federal government. If every individual business on Main Street as well as on Wall Street gets together and does this, there's a huge benefit to both the environment but also to cost. And the other individual that we're sticking with the individual benefits items is that we really can promote safety and reduce health risks for employees by keeping them safe and secure within a comfortable environment. So most people are pretty comfortable in their home environment. They know how to navigate it pretty well. Uh, they, they are primarily used to, to doing and functioning in that environment. And we can also work to make sure that the workspace that they set up is effective so that they are not increasing their repetitive stress injury issues. Uh, and of course, by not commuting, they're, they're covering themselves from a whole host of other problems from just walking out the front door uh, and getting in a car. So lots of different important self safety and health risks that I won't get into, but those, that's really definitely a benefit. Next up is uh, the, the really great benefit uh, to the company, which increased labor productivity. That means your employees will be more productive. As Marissa Mayer noted, as I said earlier in the quote that she, she, she gave at this particular uh, uh, press conference or uh, workshop uh, seminar that she gave, she was explaining, you know, her employees are more productive when they work alone. And uh, that's really important to understand that we, we do do well when we are working individually. If it reduces employee turnover, there is a huge retention program uh, in, involved in this whole concept of a telecommuting program, which is that happy workers stay with your company. And if it takes, I, I think I've read averages of about ten to twenty thousand dollars to bring on every employee. That's the cost to a business to be able to to, to bring on a new employee. So the cost of acquisition, if we can reduce that cost of acquisition by reducing the employee turnover, then that's only going to benefit small business around, around the United States. So I think that can be really an important factor in your decision to institute a telecommuting program. Next up, if you reduce business class, you can reduce office space. You can reduce your supplies used. And of course, if you're using technology smarter, that means that you're going to reduce the overall energy costs. You're going to reduce the overall hardware and software costs for the company. And we're going to talk about that in the third part of this webinar about how to use technology well. Most of these technologies are very, very low cost. And they allow you to be able to do some really amazing things for your telecommuting uh, folks. So let's get into the telecommuting program. What are some effective policies, and really in, in that term I mean guidance, for making sure that you can institute a great telecommuting program policy and then, of course, get your telecommuters off and running in their home environments or wherever they're going to be working from their home offices and uh, doing that effectively. So let's just sort of get over the first big hurdle, which is this ongoing concern that telecommuters basically get up in the morning and they don't even get out of bed and they drag their laptops over to their to their uh, their laps and they sit down and they basically watch YouTube uh, all day <laughs> instead of actually doing work. That, that's a huge misnomer. Uh, you know, the reality is is that for most people, they have intrinsic motivation to excel in a company and that's really an organizational cultural issue, not necessarily that of the individual. Of course, we'll talk about how we can make sure the individual is excited to work every day and the responsibilities associated with being in a telecommuting program that, that you know, sitting in bed and, uh, and lounging and, and, and loafing are not what telecommuting programs are all about. And it's much your job as a, as a business owner, but also as much the 
uh, the responsibility of the individual telecommuter to make sure that happens. But this, by and large, does not happen. People don't just sit in bed all day and do nothing because they're told that they can telecommute. Okay, so we'll talk about how to how to really overcome that. And the second is the changing face and nature of the U.S. workforce. What we are realizing, in by and large, is that the U.S. workforce is very much changing, and there are some positives and benefits, uh, positives and, and uh, negative consequences to that. You know, the reality is is that in a in a in a regular office environment, you'll see pictures very similar to this, especially in more tech-oriented businesses, which is you know becoming more and more uh, prevalent today. But mostly office work environments, you see people with headphones on because they don't want to be distracted. And uh, in this particular case, this gentleman has a, a facial piercing, and sometimes businesses don't or do or don't particularly like those kinds of things. And uh, and so there's a changing face of, of of the work environment and as well as the workforce. Their values are very different, and there are some things that we can do culturally with the company to make sure that we are poisoning ourselves to both both put out a good image for our customer base, our, our target audience while still engaging the productivity of our employees so that they're excited to work and they're really captivated to be able to do that. So let's talk about what my sort of seven guidelines are for TP. Okay. First up is have a written policy. Okay. I know this seems like overburdening the business owner, but you know what? It is absolutely necessary. Like having a written business plan, even if it's just one of these one-page business plans, increases your rate of success from startup to those first three years to the next two years to make your five-year goal and then on to ten. You know, the reality is, is that if you want a small business to be successful, you have to put things in writing. And one of the things to have is if you're going to institute a telecommunication program, is to have a telecommunications policy in place. And the real problem for small businesses is that when they don't have those in place, that you open yourself up to all sorts of legal and, quite honestly, business cost problems. You know, at the end of the day, legal problems are really just money problems. If you want to be able to reduce costs, put it in writing up front, make sure that you communicate it, make sure that you're transparent with everyone in the organization, and you'll be that much better off. Next step. Make sure that you involve the right parties. When I talked about earlier, you know, the idea of me sitting down and instituting this telecommuting policy and then the program on top of that, one of the things that was really the success factor was having the right people involved. You know, I needed the right IT, the right technology folks. I needed human resources to be involved. And where the company didn't have those pieces, we made sure that we brought consultants in to be able to fit into those places. This is not high cost. This is strategically using, you know, time of the right professionals at the right time to meet, make sure that everybody gets together, gets the right ideas on the table, and therefore the right policies are instituted. Make sure that you have all of the key players in the policy development at the table as well. You might have key managers within your company, potentially key frontline people, administrative staff that's frontline that sees people every day. You might, they might see patterns of when people show up at the office. If you're salaried workers, you typically don't track hours. So you may not have a very good idea of when people actually show up at the beginning of the day. But you better believe that the person sitting at the front desk, they have a better understanding of when people show up and when they leave. And that might be very helpful in understanding what the telecommuting program looks like, as well as when do people go out for lunch? How long do the sales staff spend on the road? And you know, how much does that hinder or help their ability to, to make sales happen because they have to run back and forth between the office when most of their sales may be in a region where they live, and so they're commuting maybe two hours uh, sometimes uh, to make it to and from their headquarters locations when they can do all of that work basically from home, but they feel an obligation to be seen within the organization and so therefore come to the, come to the office. Make sure you have the right people involved so that you know who needs to be met uh, in order to know what needs to be put into and how the policy needs to be convened. All right, 
patients are allowed to telecommute. All right, now this is sort of a very, very big topic, and I, I'm not going to have time to cover the whole thing. In general, this, this whole concept of small business telecommuting success is a, is a full day workshop that I do. And, you know, we, I cover, I'm covering these first three points of the, of the, of, of this in the webinar on a, on a much more overview level. But I also talk about how to train yourself and your staff to develop an ideal office, home office environment or anywhere office as they call it. Uh, you know, making sure that you have the right mindset and the right productivity habits for your staff. Uh, making sure that you have all the standards involved for great communication, which I'll talk about shortly. And then, of course, how to maintain, establish and maintain a good business culture uh, for that. So there's lots of different stuff that's involved in all of this, but I want to focus right now on what roles are really allowed to telecommute. And that really means coming back to the table and figuring out the, people's who, the people who can telecommute and what that really means for your business. So in, uh, in 2009, uh, Forrester Research put out a report. It, it was called, uh, It's Time to Review and Renew Your Telecommuting Policy. And then they outlined four questions that really every telecommuting policy should cover. And I agree with them, except that I've considered it seven questions, if you want to call it that, or seven guidelines. But the first question is, who is eligible? That is, who is eligible to be able to telecommute, whether that be part-time or full-time or just some kind of regular hybrid? of that. And, uh, you know, it, it really determines from company, in, you know, depends company to company who is eligible. But in general, in general, you really want to look at your company and look at the individuals who are, one, already highly productive. And they're really highly productive no matter where they are. They're just, they have type A behaviors. And uh, those people tend to be productive no matter where they, where they are. And those are probably good candidates for telecommuting. One is they have high level of job skills. So your highest level job skills folks are going to be the ones who are capable of being flexible and adaptable because they have mastery of skills and therefore they know how to do those in many different places under many different circumstances. They should have excellent communication skills. You don't want to take a poor communication skills player in your environment and put them into a telecommuting program, not out the gate. It's going to create a whole host of problems for you because you're going to get frustrated with their lack of communication and or their poor communication response to yours, and it's just going to become a problem for you. Don't put poor communicators in telecommuting programs until you've effectively trained them in effective communication skills. So make sure that you, you take care of that. You want to make sure people uh, you know, are good uh, workers without supervision. So if the person needs a heavy amount of supervision to be able to make their job happen, they're not going to be a, 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 a successful telecommuter either. Uh, you're going to make sure that they're well organized, that they have, you know, uh, they have the ability to keep management informed of their progress on projects and on client work. And they have to be able to uh, still make sure that they can interact with their staff well. That is, they know how to keep relationships functioning when they may or may not be in, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives. You don't want to make sure that they, these are people who are, who are um, you know, relators uh, in the social style. We always talk about the, the people who are, who are amiables and socials. And socials are people who need to really interact with people. They need to communicate with people in order to get things done. It's the way in which they sort of exist. And uh, so we want to make sure that we don't put those people who are really socials into an environment where they're isolated because then they're going to not be able to get anything done. Uh, because they're going to feel that isolation and get and get potentially depressed or whatever it might be. And of course, they need to be able to get into the office for scheduled meetings. This is telecommuting is not about you know putting somebody out in the wilderness and and uh, giving them a phone, internet access, and a, and a laptop, and forgetting they exist as long as they get their work done. This is really about creating an environment that's flexible so that people can can still come to the office and if they if there is one uh, to be able to meet with people for scheduled meetings or meeting in other locations. There are many different options for having, having workspaces or meeting collaboration spaces without having a physical office space all the time. So make sure that those people that But you want to make sure that those roles, you, you've defined what those roles look like, which particular jobs in your company work well for, for telecommuting, and start there. Set yourself up for the momentum to get immediate success with the initial folks with regard to telecommuting, and then you can make your way on to other roles over time. On, uh, as the point four of the seven guidelines, 
we're going to talk about human resources. Human resources really is a full cultural change, and you really need to talk to human resources experts in your area to talk about what performance-based versus clock-watching paradigm culture shift needs to, and it needs to happen. So what this really means is that you have a lot of people who think that showing up from 9 to 5 and just putting in the time equates to doing a, a good day's work. And no longer is that the case. Maybe you even have that perspective, and you have to sort of overcome this reality. But results matter in your business more than the time spent sitting at the desk. Uh, you know, in a retail environment, I completely understand. You have hours of operation, and you have to be there for those periods of time to be able to make sure that your customers are satisfied when they walk in the front door. However, in a service-based business and other businesses where that's not necessarily the case, you have to be very well aware of what performance and results are necessary. What are those metrics to make sure that your staff is aware of them so the culture changes from I have to be logged in at 9 a.m. and I have to log out at 5 p.m. and I'm not going to think about work any other time than that to a new paradigm, which is what's going to make this company successful? What does success look like? And really work toward what that success looks like. If that means the, the, the teleworker, telecommuter, I mean, can go ahead and effectively do his job in a reduced amount of time, what does it matter to you if they're salaried? You're, you can make sure that they are uh, doing that job effectively. And if they're, you know, if they're hourly workers, even more so, that's better for you because if they're, they're telecommuting part-time, that part-time telecommuting is going to be you know, like not double, but you know, it's going to have a rate of increasing or compound benefits to you because they're going to do more when they're telecommuting than when they're in the office. So you know that when they go to their telecommuting uh, location, whether it's home or home office, they're going to be that much more productive. So you can actually key in to that productivity and make sure they, that you know that the most important projects go into that time slot when they're telecommuting as opposed to when they're in the office. Really, really important for you to really pay, pay, pay attention to the performance-based model of business today. Next up is really the technology code and technology. And so technology being the other side to this, point five is making sure that you have really the four fundamentals of the business, which is in terms of, in terms of infrastructure for telecommuting. They need to have a phone whether that is a phone that you give them or their own phone. Some businesses have decided to have a dedicated company line installed uh, so that they are, you know, you have a landline basically in their home where the phone rings, it has a business voicemail, and, you know, that's, that's the company's phone. Uh, some have decided to just uh, partially pay for a mobile plan, you know, so that they have a, a, a uh, mobile plans or service that, that is, uh, you know, the business's use is paid for. And some have decided that everybody gets issued a device, a mobile phone, and the company's property and the company basically pays for it, and that's used exclusively for business purposes. Uh, email, we know about the ubiquity of email. I'm not going to really spend too much time on that. And uh, then, of course, we have uh, internet and hardware. And this is where the problems really begin, because a lot of people believe that if you're going to sell up a telecommuting program, all you need to do is give a laptop, phone, and internet service to the employee and tell them to go home and work. And that's not really how it works. Internet is really fundamental to them being able to work as a telecommuter. We know that their ability to get things done in their home environment is important. But what does that look like? How much internet is really necessary? You need to really analyze how much access to the internet, what kind of broadband services are necessary, whether they're going to be using their own internet service or if they're going to, again, have the business extend an internet service for you. Looking at your office space rental and how much internet service you have in the office already versus now when that person's not there, how much less internet do you need when that individual is physically not situate in your office? Well, you can sometimes offset that internet broadband cost and then, of course, be able to pay for part of your telecommuter's internet service uh, so that you can go ahead and do that. But that requires you to analyze internet usage, make sure that you know how much internet usage is used on a monthly basis, on an annual basis by each of your, each of your workers in your office, 
and then of course translate that to how much internet is going to be used by those folks when they leave the office. Of course, if they're remotely connected to your mainframe, you know, your servers back at the office, well, they're going to be using a lot more internet on both sides. So don't think that you're going to necessarily be able to win out on the internet cost. Your internet costs might actually go up if those workers move off-site and so on and so forth. So really think about the numbers here in terms of what is necessary and what's not necessary regarding internet access. As well, make sure that you, you have an idea about fundamentally what can be sent and received across that business internet infrastructure. So if you decide to have a DSL or, or cable service installed in a, in a telecommuter uh, home, uh, what can they traffic across that web service? You may have to just tell them, you know, only these particular things can be used for this web service because that might create liability for you as as the business owner. So make sure that you're you're paying attention to what they're what they're uh, you know uh, doing with regard to internet as well. And that might be require you to go ahead and uh, institute some kind of software to monitor. Uh, the traffic and so on and so forth. It depends on the, the sophistication of your structure your, and, and, the, and the necessity of it all regarding what might, what might be uh, you know, communicated via that internet. You know, if it's really sensitive data, you don't want them really using it any, any, for anything other than the, the sensitive data. If it's not so sensitive, it's just research and online research and that kind of thing, then it might not be that much of an issue. Hardware is one of those things that people realize is uh, is a problem only after it happens, which is, you know, uh, a printer, for instance, printer and sometimes fax. Fax is still, a, you know, a technology that people use. And so does, does your staff ha have access to printers and uh, fax copiers at their homes? Typically not. I mean, you know, maybe they have a home uh, inkjet printer that, that they have or maybe a home laser printer. Those are sometimes not sophisticated enough to handle the kinds of printing that are necessary in a business environment. So make sure that your staff is not just printing, you know, things and shipping them off thinking that they're the same quality as your office equipment. Maybe it is. I'm not sure, but you really need to make sure you're paying attention to that. Make sure that if you're if you um, have your staff using their own desktop or laptop at home that they have you know security software on it, you know, basically making sure that viruses aren't affecting your business data and all of those things. So make sure that you have appropriate licenses for things, you know. So if a staff member, for instance, pirates a piece of software and is using it at home and all of a sudden you get a cease and desist letter from, say, Microsoft or from another organization where they have identified this person as pirating that software, it creates a liability for you. So you want to make sure that you uh, go ahead and not only have that in the policy, but also make sure that you look into uh, what's what's happening. So this is really about security, 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 making sure that things are secure enough to make you feel comfortable with the risk that you're taking. And then the other side to that is BYOD considerations. That is, bring your own device considerations. So most people think of BYOD when it comes to bringing a mobile phone or a laptop or a mobile tablet to an office environment and using that for business in the office environment. But the same issues apply for a telecommuter who is working with his own device or her own device within their home environment or home office environment. So pay attention to that. Number six, the policy to cover safety of workplace, quote unquote, to where telecommuters are. So this is really important. If you allow your telecommuters to be put in harm's way while they're working, you are creating an additional risk for the business. So make sure that you go out there and make sure that your policies cover these things. Now this also means that you have to train your staff. That might mean that you have to go in and, and have an ergonomics consultant come in and help you understand how an employee should be setting up their workspaces, not only at the office, but when they're telecommuting part-time or full-time if you decide to do it that way. So what does their office at home need to look like so that they're not hurting themselves through repetitive stress injuries, back and neck ache issues, uh, you know, putting computer monitors in front of uh, in front of windows where they may get lots of glare and therefore have uh, you know eye strain and therefore you know over time their their macular um, their their eye structures go ahead and, and have degeneration. You want to pay attention to these little soft issues because they become big issues later on down the road. But really pay attention to workplace safety 
and and what that what that means slips and falls you know what does what does the equipment mean you know if you have large equipment that they are taking to and from the office and having it at home what happens if they are harmed in the use of that particular piece of hardware make sure that your safety policies what the proper effective use of those of those you know the equipment and so forth is when your staff is anywhere, not just inside your four walls. And finally, sort of encompassing sort of piece, but really communication and training are the sort of underpinnings of both the human resources and the technology issues relating to a telecommuting, tele telecommuting program. So think about it from this perspective. Successful telecommuting programs equal communication. If people are out of sight and out of mind when they're telecommuting, your telecommunication pro program is flawed. Flawed fundamentally, and it will fail. It will fail in some way, shape, or form like this. One, the telecommuter will lose load of motivation. Two, the business will start to suffer because the work is not getting done, or the work is getting done in, in an unsatisfactory way to one of the key players in your business, that is your customers, you, or themselves. So as soon as they see themselves not producing, they may feel guilt and otherwise become less productive. So you really need to make sure that all parties involved are making sure that they're reaching and meeting or exceeding the expectations of whatever's happening. But that requires communication, strong communication and consistent communication. So I'll give you one example. In my own company, we have a, a chat policy that is when we are on, we happen to use the Google Apps infrastructure, which you probably have heard me talk about in prior webinars about my love of Google. And uh, one of the things that we, we use is the Google Chat functionality within the company. Well, I have a, I have a policy. It's a, it's a, a three strikes rule. And uh, the three strikes rule is this. When you are identifying yourself as on chat, that is your green, you're at your desk, you are working, you are required to respond to the chat. So if you do not respond to staff members or to me, you have that, that's a strike. I take note of it in your human resources file, and after three, your telecommuting program privileges are completely terminated. And uh, pretty much there is no way for you to go back. The point being is that if you set your status to away, or if you turn off your chat, you're completely fine. That means you are thinking, you're away from your desk, you're not sitting at your desk. I think of chat for the company as you sitting at your desk. I should be able to walk up to you and say, hey, Sarah, can you help me with this particular issue that I'm having right now? Now, if you're not at your desk or if you're in the restroom or if you have a little sign that says, you know, on a phone call on your door and you have your door closed, I know the appropriate mechanism for being able to do that. I look at chat for telecommuters as, as the same thing. That's at your desk, you're on the phone, you're occupied, or you're not. And if you're not occupied, that means I can walk up to you and talk to you. If that chat does not function, then communications break down within the company. So that's just one example of how you know, I deal with that within my own company. But you have to create what, the, what those communication guidelines are for your, for your folks and make sure that you are con continually enforcing them and making sure that they're working. So for instance, if I realized that my chat uh, you know, policy wasn't really working, then it would be really terrible. But in all of these years, you know, what, what is it now, 13 years of me working with different telecommuting programs as a manager, you know, business owner as a manager, I've only had to stop one person from telecommuting in that entire time out of, out of literally dozens and dozens of employees. So we really pay attention to good policies how those work for you, and, and making sure that that's, that that's working. You might have that with regard to the phone or with email, a particular response time that's required for people to be able to pick up the phone or respond to people. But make sure that you have appropriate communications uh, tools in place, but primarily what those, how you're supposed to use those tools and what are the expectations when you're not there physically present. Next up is training. Training covers the whole gamut of things. Productivity training, technology training, technical skills training, making sure that people are aware of what good telecommuting 
means. That means training telecommuters to be great telecommuters. And then, of course, communications training. You want to make sure that you're covering all of those bases on the, on, on the continuum. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed safety. You want to make safety training also a part of that as well. But you want to have continual training across the, the, those particular realms to make sure that telecommuters can be great telecommuters. And uh, you don't want to skimp on this area because if you, if you skimp on training, and you can do this in all sorts of ways. Uh, for instance, within my own company, we have a series of uh, videos. You know, of course, we use, as I said, the Google Apps infrastructure. So within our Google uh, YouTube account, uh, you know, we have private videos that are all set up, and every time someone new starts telecommuting, they watch those videos, and they know what they're supposed to and what they're not supposed to do when it comes to telecommuting. And then they have tips. You know, we have a series of tip videos that they can watch to let them know what are the great, you know, sort of tips and great tricks about having great telecommuting and involved in their day-to-day -day life, in their day-to-day -day work life. And uh, it gives them a, a lot of satisfaction being able to know that they're being supported and continually improved as it relates to these particular areas. And so they get those videos over time. Okay? So those are the seven guidelines for a winning uh, telecommuting program. And if there are any questions, feel free to have Tracy break in. And otherwise, we're going to move on to telecommuting tools. And uh, so there are so many tools that are involved. I've broken them up into sort of four uh, sort of main umbrellas. Uh, I call it remote access, then communication, then document and project management, and then mail and production. So we're going to talk about each of those four areas, and then I'll close up and we'll have the ability to take Q&A afterward as well. So feel free to ask questions, and I'll be happy to answer those as we move our way along. So let's talk about sort of the big three in terms of being able to go from your office environment to your home environment or home office environment and connect back to the main office. Okay, So if you have an IT staff and an IT consultant and they handle all of the you know, work necessary to connect your laptops and desktop computers in your telecommuters environment back to your office, you probably don't need to worry about this. But if you're doing this yourself and you want to be able to make this happen really easily, one really amazing product right in the top right hand corner of your screen is LogMeIn. If you go to LogMeIn.com, they have a free tool and I would recommend that you actually pay for the LogMeIn Pro account once you do try out the free tool. But it allows you to be able to connect your staff, uh, staff from any computer in the world they can log in to their office computer. So if you really just want an easy, breezy way of letting them log in, you control all of the security from your centralized location at your office, logging in is a fantastic tool. It allows them to be able to connect uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the desktop at their office, and it's virtually as though they're sitting there at the desk. They can print locally to the, to the office computer, they can print uh, remotely to their telecommuting space, wherever they might be at home or home office, and they can, you know, literally you can stand at their desk and watch them move their cursor around the computer. So it allows them to virtually do that, and it's in a secure environment, and so you have pretty much all of the, the needs taken care of that way. What a lot of people don't know is that both Apple, Mac, Intosh, as well as Windows has had remote desktop functionality baked into it for quite some time. It's native within the operating systems, and you can go ahead and do that. So you can see the two images there. The Windows remote desktop connection is on the left-hand side of the screen, and the Apple remote desktop 3 is there right under LogMeIn's logo. And so both of those are really uh, easy tools to set up. It'll take you about 30 to 45 minutes to set up the first time, and then thereafter you could probably plug and play and do it probably within five minutes per computer thereafter. And they both work functionally the same way that LogMeIn does, except that you have to sort of worry about your own security. But if you are savvy and want to play with the technical part of that, both tools are free and they're built right into both operating systems. So whether you're a Mac or PC office, you can go ahead and institute those uh, right away. Okay? So that really covers us in terms of the do-it-yourself remote access. And we're going to move along to now communications. And as I said before, communications 
with a telecommuting program is so key. It's vital to its, to its success. And I'm just going to talk about three different products here because I want to limit us to, to in terms of time. And the three that I'm going to talk about is Microsoft's own owned Skype, and then we're going to talk about Google's Google Plus Hangouts, and then a new product on the market called Uber Conference that I happen to really, really like. And so let's talk about Skype. Skype is the granddaddy of uh, of, of digital communications, and they started as being a low-cost way to have phone conversations, uh, you know, video and phone conversations overseas. And so people who, who were maybe going to other countries and wanted to still be able to communicate with their friends and family were able to do that by Skype. And Skype over time has launched business products. And now you have the ability to video group and individual one-to-one -one and group uh, video, uh, you know, video conference calls and you can also do chat functionality, you know, that is live chat with people using Skype and all sorts of other fun things. Uh, if you do need to make a live phone call, you can pay for, for plans starting as low as, I think, $3 per month. You can have them make phone calls directly from Skype over the broadband, and uh, then you can go ahead and make those outbound phone calls. And if you have staff who's overseas, then they can, of course, call you Skype to Skype for free. So really, really great tool. And the only thing that I can say that I don't particularly like about Skype is their, their chat functionality. I feel like it's slow on occasion, and so I have some issues with the, with the speed at which Skype uh, translates and, and communicates those messages. So I don't particularly like it for chat, but for the ability to have uh, you know, group conference calls and all of those things, especially if you have people overseas, if everyone has access to Skype and broadband internet, you can basically have that all for free. Okay? Then uh, if you want to do video group, video conference uh, calls in group sessions, then you have to have a Skype premium account, and those are all very nominally cost, you know, nominal costs uh, for, for that to happen. So one, you the business owner probably needs to have the Skype premium account, and then you could of course have video with up to I believe 20 individuals, although I think 10 is probably the max that, that works effectively in my experience. All right, so then we have Google's Google Plus Hangouts. Google Plus Hangouts are a mashup of many, many different Google products over time that have now been brought under the Hangouts perspective. But basically what Google Plus Hangouts is, at least from a Google Apps perspective, is one of the most powerful communication tools uh, that Google has ever created outside what I would probably uh, you know, perceive as Google Voice being uh, one of those top tier contenders and uh, Google's uh, deprecated product uh, that was, I, I won't even get to talk about it, but Google Wave was an amazing product and it was deprecated and, and now has been open sourced. But the, the Google Plus Hangouts allows you to do a number of different things. You can chat, you can video chat, you can share screens, you can, uh, you can, you have all of these whiteboard abilities right within the tool. You can have up to 10 people in the, in the Google Hangout at any time. You can conference call people into the Google chat, so you can have people who are on their desktops call people who are on their phones. You can do all of the, most of all of this, not all of it, but most of all of this from mobile phones. So from your mobile phone, you can literally just pick it up, start a Google video Hangout, and have face-to-face -face conversation with your staff with other staff, you can add people as you go, pull them onto a phone call, have a full meeting, all with your mobile phone walking down the street. So it's a really, really powerful tool. And hopefully, if you're on the street, you're not talking about anything uh, too sensitive. So that's Google Plus Hangouts. I really recommend you give it a try. One of the other really great tools about that is that you can record the Google Plus Hangouts publicly and broadcast it. So you can do that for marketing. But for internal telecommuting purposes, you can do it all in a private setting. And, uh, and have that you know, behind the gate of your company so that you're not broadcasting that to the world. Finally is Uber Conference. When you need to do a teleconference call and you want it to be great, Uber Conference is really, really fantastic. And so uh, Uber Conference allows you to be able to do it in a number of different ways. You can start a conference now where everybody just calls in, and then you can also schedule Uber Conference calls so that you can send the conference uh, and the, the PIN for that particular conference call out to all of the recipients so they know when they need to connect. Now, what Uber Conference adds that I really enjoy using is two different things. One is its interface. So it has a web-based interface that when you log into the call, 
you can call directly in from the desktop you know, or your laptop computer, and you can see everyone when they're talking. And so you know who's talking and when they're talking. And you can even mute people, with, um, you know, people from talking if they're talking too much. Uh, you can even mute them and go on with your conversation. I don't know if that's rude or not, but you can. Uh, the other part is uh, that you can what, put, what are called putting mufflers on individuals. So say you needed to have a break off discussion with maybe two other team managers in the company, and you have you know, maybe 20 other people on the line. You can go ahead and mute the other people on the line, or just the key people you need to mute, and have that conversation just with those people, and then bring the other people back in to hearing. They didn't leave the phone conference call, they just are muted for, for the temporary purposes, and then bring them back on. So lots of really cool you know, abilities within the interface. And then the second really great tool is that if you pay for Uber Conference, which is I think $10 a month for the next tier of service, they will allow you to have a custom number, so it's your phone number, you know, that you can customize. Uh, so it can be a local, you know, local area code uh, phone number, and it will outbound call everyone at the scheduled date and time of the conference call. I don't miss conference calls now because I have Uber Conference to be able to make that phone call for me and to call me at the same time to bring us all together. So I don't have to think about when that conference call is going to happen. It's just going to call me. It's going to tell me that I have a conference call scheduled, and I need to go in there. In the, in the interface, you can also share documents. So you can share things with people just like Google Plus Hangouts and Skype. So you have the ability to document share and other things within the Uber conference environment, which is really, really fun. Okay, so moving right along, we then have document and project management. And I'm giving you three examples here, obviously by the size of the Google Drive logo, I have indicated where my uh, respect lies in terms of document management. Uh, but Google Drive is really just a very, very powerful tool. There are, of course, so many tools that I've talked about in the past in, in the, the uh, cloud webinar that we just recently did, I believe, in November. We talked about all of the various different document management tools, including Dropbox and Box and SugarSync and and, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of products out there. But the point is, is that you have to have a document management tool involved. I used Google Drive primarily because of its, its power behind the Google Apps engine to be able to control documents and make sure that they're effectively managed within the company. So Google Drive is absolutely amazing, and there are lots of other choices out there. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that there are two project management tools. And uh, Basecamp is, again, sort of the granddaddy of, of project management and project collaboration. They're made by a company out of Texas called 37 Signals. There's many other sub-products that support Basecamp's functionality. Basecamp is great. It has mobile and desktop applications, uh, d that is web desktop, uh, web browser desktop applications, as well as the mobile apps that work fantastic. And so you can do all sorts of project management, making sure that your client work is uh, effectively being managed and moving forward, and you can watch that progress happen. Asana is a new player in the market, and they have become my favorite very, very quickly. So uh, in general, I will, I will always, uh, at least recently, I have been recommending Asana like the, like the wind. I've just been pushing and pushing and pushing it, and uh, nothing seems to be outside of its abilities in terms of being able to manage large-scale projects and small projects and really reducing email so that it's a, it's a functional level amount of, of email uh, so that we don't have to worry about that too much. Asana, it is pronounced Asana, although the yogic term asana is pronounced asana, but this is pr pronounced Asana, and it is a fantastic tool. It's free for up to 30 people uh, within your particular company or organization. So if you're 30 people or less, it's free. It seems to be forever. And if you're over that, then there are nominal fees involved for having the additional uh, folks. Okay, so document project management is uh, you can just try those products and see if they they work out for you. And last but not least is mail and production. So a lot of people forget this about telecommuters is that they still have to print stuff and they still have to mail things when they happen to be at their home uh, or home or in their home office. And so uh, let's start on the right hand side again. There's Indicia, which is partnered with the US Postal Service. And uh, they have the ability for you to print postage and to print mailing labels and all sorts of other fun stuff directly onto envelopes and, and onto mailing labels that you can buy. And so you can in, enable and empower your, your staff to be able to do that. Now, the Quicken Ship for Business that is, actually lives on the USPS.com site 
of the United States Postal Service's website is also really phenomenal. I've, I've found it to be really great, and it competes very well with FedEx shipping. Uh, so I've been, I've been pretty happy with the U.S. Postal Service's click and ship products. And again, you create an account and your staff logs into that account. You know, they can go ahead and set up their shipping. It prints labels. You mail it onto your box or your letter or whatever. You print it onto labels if you need to you know, stick it onto a, a 9 by uh, 12 envelope or you can print it directly onto, uh, you know, regular number 10, 9, and 11 envelopes, probably others as well. And you just, you know, put it in the printer. It prints your labels right onto it and uh, you're good to go. So it, it's a really effective way to be able to handle sort of not having a mail room in your home so that you can go ahead and still get things uh, sent and received. And uh, there are lots of other products for being able to receive physical mail from outside of your company, so, uh, you know, your headquarters. So say your staff receives mail from clients or from someone and they need to deal with that. There, there are effective ways in which you can not only uh, have that received by a company that can then scan it and send it, so you can internally have it scanned and emailed to your uh, telecommuters uh, so that they can at least see what it is, deal with it, and then if they need to go to the office to actually retrieve the physical item, they can do that, or you can mail it to them, you can forward it along to them as well. But sort of think about that as well. There's, there, there are issues with being able to get physical things back and forth between telecommuters. And then on the left-hand side of the screen, of course, the, the two big products that help us produce material when our home printers may not be able to do that. So maybe we need to do comb binding uh, manuals or uh, you know sales presentation materials. That's something that FedEx Office or Staples Office Center are things that will be able to uh, be able to produce. Uh, one thing that I've really noticed about FedEx Office is that uh, the online interface just keeps sort of growing up. It keeps maturing in, in many different great ways. And so I really enjoy using the, the FedEx office there. But you might want to look into your local uh, small business print shops and see if they don't have their own systems. I know that uh, Miniman Press, you know, the, the locally owned uh, franchise, uh, you know, stores, they have their own internal uh, online systems as well. Maybe you can work with your local small business and support local that way and work with them to, to be able to allow your telecommuters to go ahead and do that as well. And uh, just a, a quick tip about Staples, Staples Coffee Center or Staples Office Center, they have their own issues, but one of the really important things is to actually ask them to go ahead and have their products uh, printed and, and sort of dealt with in their centralized space. And there are ways in which you can do that, but pretty much the local staff is sometimes not as well equipped as their centralized hubs. Now that usually means that you have to wait a little bit more time for your printed products. But if the quality of your, of your product is more important than the, the time frame, then having staples do it in their centralized copy centers and then ship to the local center is sometimes a little bit more, um, is, is always going to be better quality in my, in my experience. So just a, just a quick tip there about that. So that pretty much brings me to the end of telecommuting success for small businesses, and uh, I'll hand it over to Tracy for any questions, and uh, then we'll wrap up. Well, Ray, we don't have any questions um, right now. Wow. Yeah. I everybody's questions. You answered That's everybody's fantastic. questions today. <laughs> well, if anyone does have any questions, you'll see my contact information on the screen. You can go ahead and me or to one of your small business development centers throughout Virginia. Uh, in order to get an answer. So feel free to do that. And like okay. I said, there, there are lots of resources, resources online to be able to uh, be able to effectively institute a telecommuting program. So I wish everybody the greatest success in that. Great. Well, I want to go ahead and wrap up and thank everyone for participating today. Today's webinar was recorded and it will be posted within the next week on the Virginia SBDC website under live webinars and recordings. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up email on this webinar, and there will be an evaluation link in that email. Please help us to continue to improve our training by taking the time to complete the evaluation. If you'd like to complete it now, I did put a link to it in the chat window itself, so you can go ahead and click on that and fill it out now. Hope to see you all on February 20th for Launch Your Small Business website in under 24 hours. Thanks again, everyone, for participating today.